Okay, you're all set? Thank you. Hey, Mr. Kramer, thank you. All right. <clears throat> um, this is probably the only talk on at this propulsion conference that's not about propulsion, um, uh, except maybe remotely in that um, Jim and Heidi sort of like the transactional interpretation as a way of explaining how the uh, uh, <coughs> inertia gets transferred between the universe and some object. Uh, anyway, um, <coughs> the, this, this talk is about quantum mechanics, and it's probably the only quantum mechanics talk you'll ever hear that doesn't have an equation in it. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so <coughs> the structure of the talk is that first of all, I'm going to talk about what quantum entanglement and non-locality are, which I consider to be the sort of uh, the main sort of counterintuitive parts of quantum mechanics that get in the way of understanding anything else. Then I'm going to talk about the transactional interpretation. Then I'm going to apply it to various uh, quantum optics experiments and so forth to show how it, how it can be used. <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to show some new work on the process of actually forming a transaction in the transactional interpretation. I had originally thought you just sort of had to take the transactions for granted, but I learned from Carver Mead that there's a way of using quantum mechanics to actually show how a transaction emerges uh, as, as part of the process, and, then, and, then, and that will be the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, to get started, <coughs> um, here we have an object that's uh, breaking up, uh, whoops, it, 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 it's breaking up into a couple of pl uh, p pieces, and uh, in Newtonian mechanics, each of these pieces has a definite momentum, a definite angular momentum, a different, definite mo uh, uh, <coughs> energy, because these are conserved quantities. However, in quantum mechanics, there's a problem, because the uncertainty principle, uh, <coughs> the, the, the quantities that the uncertainty principle uh, <coughs> talks about are, this, are many of the same properties that are conserved in these conservation laws. And so you have this, di this dichotomy between <coughs> what's uncertain and what has to be conserved. Uh, <coughs> when quantum mechanics systems breaks up, it parts, its parts may have indefinite values of energy, momentum, and angular momentum as described by the uncertainty principle. And after the components are separated, they, do, they are not independent and they may continue to depend on each other even, even as the parts of the system separate. And so this is the problem. Uh, <coughs> Non-locality comes from these two seemingly conflicting incompatible aspects. Energy, momentum, angular momentum are conserved quantities in quantum system and in the absence of external forces and torques, their net values must remain <coughs> unchanged as the system evolves. However, the wave function describing the emitted particles uh, is subject to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and it allows the energy, momentum, and angular momentum to, have to be indefinite and span a, a whole range of different values. And this non-specificity <coughs> uh, persists until a measurement collapses the wave function, and these values become fixed. And this is a real problem in a multi-body system <coughs> because measurements in various places all have to agree in order to make the, the, cons uh, the conserved quantities work out. Uh, and this is the nature of the EPR paradox. Uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen pointed out that there was this problem in quantum mechanics in about 1935 <coughs> where these uh, system components have to uh, observe these conservation laws even though they could be light years apart when the, when the measurements are made. So <coughs> what do you do about it? Well. First of all, uh, Schrodinger uh, took up the torch immediately and, and published several papers investigating this property and, can, and coined the term entangled. Uh, what it means is that the parts, the, even when the, way, the, parts, the components are separated, the wave functions com continue to depend on each other and cannot be spe separately specified. Uh, in particular, they depend on each other in such a way that conserved quantities must add up to the values possessed overall. Einstein der derisively called this quantum behavior spooky actions at a distance. He didn't think it was there. And uh, <clears throat> it was a controversy for a long time until people began to do quantum optics experiments to test whether it was there or not. And sure enough, it was. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the <clears throat> this kind of quantum non-locality is a real property. Uh, it's something you have to take into account. And the question is, what's going on? What's the mechanism behind this? 
And <clears throat> the answer to this question can be provided by the transactional interpretation, which I'll talk about next. Uh, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> this is... Uh, uh, this is a, cart uh, a cartoonist friends of mine, mine's version, a Wheeler and Feynman, as a, in their 1945 versions when they published the Wheeler-Feynman Absorber Theory paper. Uh, basically, uh, in conventional uh, electrodynamics, uh, the wave equation is a second-order differential equation in time, and this means it has two solutions. Uh, one of the solutions is the one we normally use, <coughs> which is a wave going forwards in time, carrying an energy and momentum into the future. And the other is a wave going backwards in time, the so-called advanced wave, uh, <coughs> carrying energy and momentum into the past. Uh, and the conventional way of dealing with this uh, uh <coughs> funny solution is to throw it away and say causality uh, keeps this from happening. Well, causality is not really a boundary condition. It's a, sort of a prejudice, uh, an observation. And it's not the way mathematicians usually solve, uh, select the solutions of differential equations. And so Wheeler and Feynman decided to look at it. Uh, they were trying to solve <coughs> the self-energy problem. It turns out that didn't work. But anyway, I, I, won't, I won't worry about that. But they basically formulated a <coughs> version of quantum, ele quantum electrodynamics where <coughs> the advanced solution and the, and the uh, <clears throat> retarded solution are treated even-handedly and you allow both uh, waves going forwards in time and going backwards in time. And so you get a, what, what, what I like to call a Wheeler-Feynman handshake. Here's a, uh, <clears throat> an object that has, uh, uh, <clears throat> is going, this time is running this way. This object has a, an excited atom. It sends a retarded wave into the future to a potential absorber over here. It sends, a, <clears throat> at the same time, because of the Wheeler-Feynman boundary condition that sends an advanced uh, wave back into the past <clears throat> going off in this direction. Over here, the absorber receives the <clears throat> wave that's coming at it and, and makes one that cancels it out here. So these, these cancel to zero. At the same time, it makes an advanced wave which goes back down the track to the point of emission, handshakes with the other, ratifies the transaction, and energy and momentum is, is <clears throat> transferred and conserved. <clears throat> this is a way of doing electrodynamics, which is equ equivalent to the conventional way. It's not a very good way of doing calculations because you have to know a lot about what's going on in the future, and that sort of prevents you from using it as a, as a, as a calculational tool. Nevertheless, it's completely equivalent to conventional classical ele electrodynamics. Now, <clears throat> this is where I come into the act. Uh, <clears throat> in the early 80s, I realized that you could apply this kind of uh, Wheeler-Feynman logic to quantum mechanics as well. Quantum mechanics has all of these wave function psi uh, in the formalism, and also the wave function psi star. They're, they're always there together. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, what is it you do to a wave function when you take its complex conjugate? Well, what you basically do is reverse the direction of time and run, make it run in the other direction. So one can as assume that the size that appear in the quantum <coughs> formalism are retarded waves, and the psi stars that, that are appearing in the formalism are advanced waves, and they're shaking hands with each other and <coughs> making transactions that allow things to go forward. Now, I don't have time to go into great detail about the, the details of, the, <coughs> of the, uh, uh, <coughs> the process, but I'll, uh, I'll say some, a few things about it, and you can read further if you want. I'll give you a reference at the end. <clears throat> the, the transaction is essentially a standing wave that forms in space-time, transferring energy, momentum, and so forth from one particle at one location to another. <clears throat> Here is a three-step process. The uh, emitter sends out an offer wave, which goes into the future. The absorber over here responds to the offer wave by <clears throat> sending a confirmation wave back to the emitter and this is the first two steps of a multi-step process in which a, a transaction builds up, going back and forth and back and back, back and forth and back and forth <clears throat> until the process goes to completion. <clears throat> um, what does this do for you? Well, for example, here we have uh, a, uh, uh, <clears throat> an experiment involving entanglement in which we have a polarized source here, 
a, a source of polarized light here, which uh, is uh, angular momentum zero. This basically means that when photons go out from the source, they have to be in the same polarization state. If they're right circularly polarized, they both have to be right circularly polarized. If they're left circularly polarized, they both have to be left circularly polarized. If they're linearly polarized, they both have to have the same linear polarization, either vertical or horizontal, and so forth. Uh, how does that, how is that arranged? You detect one photon over here and measure its polarization. You detect another photon over here and measure its polarization. How is na does nature choreograph, do the choreography so that these things always match, <clears throat> no matter what kind of uh, measurement you do, do on the polarization states? Well, the answer is <clears throat> that there is a transaction that forms <clears throat> uh, going out this way and coming back this way and handshaking both at the source and at the two, two detector positions. And the only way that transaction can form is if all the bookkeeping works out properly. If this has the right polarization, this has the right polarization, these things match when they come back. <clears throat> so you can form any kind of transaction you want, but, uh, but only the transactions that, in which the polarizations match are allowed to form. <clears throat> Okay, so let's apply this to some uh, interpretational paradoxes. Question? The Schrodinger equation is first order in time derivatives and not second order, so why do you get forward and backward time propagating? You, you say you're talking about the Schrodinger equation. Is that right? Is that right? right yeah. yeah. Um, the Schrodinger equation is the non-relativistic -rel reduction of, a rel of what's an underlying relativistic equation like the Klein-Gordon equation or the Dirac equation, and both of those are second order in time. So. Uh, basically, if you take the Klein-Gordon equation <clears throat> and reduce it, uh, you get two equations. One of them is the Schrodinger equation, and the other is the complex conjugate of the Schrodinger equation. And, <clears throat> and, so, and, they, and the, the latter has the advanced wave solutions. Okay. So the Dirac equation is first order in time. Jeff. What? The Dirac equation is first but order. It yeah, but it has, uh, it has advanced and retarded solutions as part of it anyway. Well, if you uh, have antiparticles. You have to have antiparticles. Yes. But the, I mean, that's a property of fermions. And, and, but yeah, the Dirac equation has, it has advanced solutions just as, well, just as well. Well, do you want to also comment on, on Dirac's paper about advanced solutions? Hmm? Yeah, I, uh, I, I was just reading before this conference uh, Dirac's 1938 paper on uh, uh, classical electrodynamics using... Uh, yes, uh, Wheeler and Feynman sort of were standing on Dirac's shoulders, actually. Uh, he, he did the time symmetric business before, before Wheeler and Feynman ever did. Um, and uh, the, 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 and the, uh, the, what they added was they, they were basically, you know, I guess I should have mentioned Dirac, uh, what, what they were basically trying to do was solve the self-energy of the electron problem using this kind of thing by assuming that a, 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 a charged particle doesn't in, does not interact with its own own field, and that turned out to be a shaky assumption that didn't work. And so this is not the Wheeler and Feynman electrodynamics is not a way of solving the self-energy problem, but it's a perfectly valid way of doing electrodynamics. <coughs> Okay, so um, this is probably the first quantum mechanical paradox. In 1927, there was something uh, called the Solvay Conference, <clears throat> in which, uh, which was sort of the uh, opening, uh, uh, grand opening of, of, of uh, quantum mechanics, in which uh, Schrodinger and Dirac and Heisenberg, uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg, and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> others introduced the new <laughs> quantum mechanics and talked about it. And Einstein raised his hand and he said, I have a problem with this. He said, let's imagine that a source here is emitting a, a spherically symmetric wave, which is going out into the world and, <clears throat> and getting progressively bigger and bigger like a bubble blowing up. And finally it comes to a detector and the detector detects it and according to the quantum mechanical solution, or quantum mechanical description that you just gave us, the bubble pops and, stop, and it is not there anymore. Now, how is it? Whoops. How is it that the bubble over here knows that it's supposed to go away 
when the detection occurs. And uh, <clears throat> he says, this sounds like magic. I don't understand it. And uh, Heisenberg said, oh, Albert, you just don't understand what's going on. The, uh, <clears throat> what this wave equation, wave, wave function is, is not a wave traveling through space. It's a met representation of the knowledge of some observer. And the observer doesn't know where the uh, way the particle went until it gets there, <coughs> and when, he, when the detector detects the particle, then the, then, then the knowledge changes, and that's why the wave function goes away. This is Heisenberg's knowledge interpretation. It <coughs> works reasonably well for simple, simple non-locality problems, but it fails miserably when you get into situations where you have a whole lot of different, different detections going on at the same time. <coughs> um, the way the transactional interpretation explains this is that there is a, a handshake between the source and the detector uh, transferring the energy and momentum to this detector rather than the others. It could have just as well gone, into one of the, gone to one of the other detectors, but this is the one it went to. And because of the boundary condition that the source is emitting only one photon, it's only allowed to go to one detector at a time. And it's only allowed to form one of these transactions, and that's why the bubble pops. It doesn't really pop. It keeps on going, but only one transaction is allowed to form. <clears throat> okay, here's another... Uh, so what decided that <coughs> What? Physically, what, what, what decided that transaction? Was it the... Uh, <clears throat> basically, what's going on is uh, the, wave, the uh, offer waves go out, the confirmation waves come back from several detectors, and... <clears throat> uh, at random, uh, but based on a uh, sort of a hierarchy where the, cl the ones that are, that are closer uh, get preference. Let me go back. <coughs> the, uh, the transaction forms. And so this the, <coughs> the source here receiving the, uh, the first order handshakes from, from all of the different sources has to choose one of these to form a transaction. And this, this is where the randomness of quantum mechanics comes in. Uh, okay. So how does that choice get made? Um, well, the, none of these things are, are happening in isolation. There are many things in the universe going on at the same time, so there are, whole, there are a whole lot of, of, of random perturbations on the source coming in from, from waves, coming in from everywhere, and that determines it, but not in a way that you can pr predict, so it, it's, it's, it's a stochastic process. Okay, so this is the famous two-slit experiment. We have a uh, <coughs> plane wave coming in here. It goes through a slit, spreads it out some. It goes, it goes through two slits. Uh, <coughs> the uh, waves from one slit and the other slit form play, uh, regions where there is constructive and destructive interference, and we get an interference pattern. If we modify this, uh, this, this situation by putting a polarized... Uh, uh, <coughs> a, uh, a, a half wave plate which changes the polarization over one of these slits, then the uh, whoops. Then the putting a half wave plate over over one slit, then the interference pattern is replaced by a diffraction pattern. The interference goes away. The interference is killed by having one polarization coming from one slit and the other polarization coming from the other slit. So that's something one would like to understand and explain. Another aspect of this is that if you watch this interference pattern building up uh, photon by photon, you can put a, uh, <coughs> a, a, these days it's fairly easy to do, you can put a detector here which can detect single photons and you can watch as progressively the interference pattern builds up with more and more and more photons. And what you see is that even though individual photons are coming through and being detected on the screen, together they form the interference pattern, <clears throat> and as you do more and more, the interference pattern becomes clearer and clearer. Uh, Richard Feynman uh, described the situation as the <clears throat> central mystery uh, of quantum mechanics, the, the fact that you can have a, this uh, wave-like phenomenon building up one photon at a time uh, from, from individual particles. <clears throat> okay, so how do you understand that? Well. In the transactional interpretation, if, you're, if there's no polarizer here, the, the uh, offer waves can go through both slits, uh, <coughs> inter uh, arrive over here and interfere, and <coughs> uh, 
stimulate the production of a transaction which goes uh, with the advanced waves going back through both slits, handshaking back to the source, and you get a, a two-slit process. However, if you put the polarizer there, <coughs> then the wave coming back here, uh, the, the retarded wave, or advanced wave coming back here has the wrong polarization, cannot participate in the handshake, and so you get a one-slit event, <coughs> one-slit process rather than a two-slit process, and this kills the interference. Uh, so it's easy to understand the thing that was uh, <coughs> the strange properties of, of the two-slit experiment using the transactional interpretation. Uh, <coughs> this is a, another uh, thing proposed by John Wheeler called the delayed choice experiment. We basically have a setup with two slits, and we can either put in a uh, detector plane here which can detect the interference pattern, or we can drop the detector plane, let the, let the light continue on through. Behind the, detect the, the removable detector plane is a lens which brings the images of the two slits to a focus. And so if we do this experiment, we can tell whether the particle went through slit one or slit two by seeing whether, the, whether it arrived here or whether it arrived here. If we put the, the uh, <coughs> interference plane here, uh, we can see the interference pattern, which tells us that this is the interference is a result of having the particle go, th having the waves go through both slits. So this is a two-path measurement. This is a one-path measurement. <clears throat> we can either measure wave-like properties or particle-like properties, depending on whether we put this thing up or down. Uh, <clears throat> Wheeler's trick is to say, okay. Uh, <clears throat> We, ha we need to decide whether, the, particle, whether the, the light went through both slits or one slit, but we don't decide which experiment to do until the, uh, <coughs> the, the, photon, the, the light wave has reached this region here. So we wait till after the waves have had, have had to go through the slit, and then we decide whether we're going to do the first experiment or the second experiment. Uh, <coughs> and so we therefore sort of retro-causally decide whether this was a one-slit event or a two-slit event. Uh, how do you explain that with this, uh, that process? Well, the transactional interpretation doesn't have much problem with that. Um, let's see, do I have a, no, back. <coughs> if we have a two-slit event, the, the, the transaction forms by the retarded waves coming and arriving here, the advanced waves going back, shaking hands along both paths, and producing a two-slit event. On the other hand, here, if we det detect here, the <coughs> waves uh, going back are all fo going back through the lens are all focused on this slit. None of, there is no way that a, that a wave going back this way can reach this point here. So the handshake apply, uh, goes only between only only involves slit two, and so we get a one-slit ha one-path handshake rather than a two-path handshake. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether we decide when we decide to do the measurement because <coughs> having things go going uh, in the reverse time direction uh, sort of will let, <coughs> allows you to stop worrying about when the decision is made. <coughs> okay, uh, now I want to talk about a variation of this, uh, and I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. Uh, we <coughs> do this uh, two-slit measure, this which, which way measurement I was just des describing with one variation. We have previously measured the interference pattern, and so we put wires in the places where we found the interference minimum. Wherever the thing went to zero, we put a wire there. And we can put these wires in or take them out. <coughs> okay, and what we observe is that if we allow only light to go up to only through one of these slits, the, the wires block about 6% of, uh, <coughs> of the light going through. So the, in the which way set, set up, we uh, place a set of wires with 6% opacity in the way. <coughs> and we place uh, a detector at image two over here, and we measure the flux of light that, that's arriving at this detector. We just integrate all the, all the counts we get here. Okay, now I, uh, <coughs> I have a question for the audience. Uh, the question is, will interference be present or not in this situation? We're doing a which way measurement, and option A is that, Niels, as Niels Bohr taught us, when we do particle-like which way measurements, all the wave properties are absent, and wave interference, uh, and no wave interference can be observed. Therefore, we should see 6% of the flux. 
Option B is interference is still there. The wires have been placed in, in, in minima where there's cancellation and the wave amplitudes are zero, therefore the wires will intercept almost no flux. So I'd like to show, have a show of hands. How many people vote for, for option A? <laughs> Two, okay. <laughs> How many people vote for option B? <laughs> Uh, yes, and that's the right answer. Uh, uh, when I first encountered this experiment, I went around to my colleagues at the University of Washington posing this question, and almost all of them voted for option A. So, uh, so you're more sophisticated than the University of Washington Physics Department. <laughs> uh, okay, here's the, here's the experimental results. Uh, this is what, what you see with, the grid, with no grid and the light going through both slits. You see this sort of baseline image that looks like that. Uh, by the way, this, this work was done by, by Shar, Afshar while well, <clears throat> he was a visiting scientist at Harvard. And uh, it, uh, he had a lot of trouble getting it published because a lot of people didn't like the results of his experiments. Uh, <clears throat> this when, is, when did you do this? About 12 years ago. Um, <clears throat> this uh, is a... Uh, uh, what happens when you when you block this slit and you let light, light only through this slit? That indeed you see that uh, the <clears throat> that the uh, that six point six percent of the light is removed uh, from the uh, from the system by these wires when you have only one slit there. Now, when you open the other slit, however, uh, something interesting happens. Namely, uh, uh, you get. Uh, uh, actually, a little less, a little more than uh, within within errors, you get you get you get 100 percent. But it, but what you actually measured is a little more than 100 percent going through. So opening both slits g gives you more or less like this rather than like this. That the uh, the loss is less than 0.1 percent uh, go going through the grid. So the wires do not stop the light when you have a two slit measurement. Uh, this is another view of the same experiment. Uh, this is <clears throat> when you have one slit open uh, and the wires in, you see all of this junk here caused by scattering from the, from the wires. Uh, this is <clears throat> what happens when there's no wires. This is sort of uh, the, two, the two slits showing up at the two image points with a little bit of airy scattering, uh, air, uh, <clears throat> airy uh, interference and so forth around the edges. And this is what happens when you put the wires in uh, with two slits open. Almost nothing happens. The, you get pretty much the same uh, <coughs> uh, profile here as here. You don't see all of this stuff caused by the wires. So the conclusion is <coughs> that interference is still present even when unambiguous which way measurements are performed. Uh, measuring particle-like behavior does not suppress wave-like behavior if you make careful non-interactive measurements. And it appears that simultaneously one, waves pass through both slits to create the interference, and two, a photon passes through only one slit. So how do we interpret this? Well, the Copenhagen interpretation has some problems because uh, <clears throat> it tells us that quantum interference between waves only occurs when the waves are indistinguishable, that we, when we have a which-way measurement, the, the waves are distinguishable, and therefore the interference should vanish. And the after our experiment falsifies that kind of assertion. Uh, the Winnie Whirls interpretation has a similar problem because it says that you get interference between whirls only when they're physically uh, uh, <coughs> can't can occur when they're physically distinguishable. Those two whirls for the for the uh, um, uh, <coughs> thing, uh, wires were physically distinguishable, and so the after our experiment falsifies that assertion as well. The transactional interpretation doesn't really have much problem with this. Uh, the offer waves or what, what's interfering, they reach the wires and cancel out, so you can't have flux to the wires because there are no offer waves there to form transactions. Therefore, all the offer waves that can allow to have transactions go all the way through to the detector, and so you should get 100%. What question? Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, when Afshar uh, initially tried to publish this, uh, he encountered resistance from... Uh, Physical review letters... Uh, uh, physics letters, um, uh, quantum, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He, so, so he, he submitted to about five journals, and it was always rejected because he said things, nasty things about Bohr's assertions. So, how ten years afterwards, uh, the mainstream uh, people that were opposed, uh, there were Bohr followers, 
Because they changed their mind or they have to wait? Well, uh, Jim Woodward was telling me something interesting about something that Max Planck said once. They, uh, they asked him whether the people who had been opposed to his quantization ideas ever changed their minds. and. Planck said, no, they died. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so where, where did they get published? OK, um, this is another uh, experiment. This was the, basically the, the uh, bellwether experiment that convinced the, wor the physics world that non-locality was really something that had to be taken seriously. It's the friedman clauser test of Bell's inequalities. Basically, you have an entangled two fun. This is not exactly the way they did it because they were dealing with very primitive equipment and their polarizers were giving them trouble. But anyway, this is a, sort of an idealized way of, of, of doing the experiment. You have an entangled two photon source. It sends a photon to the right and to the left. Here you have a polarizing beam splitter that sends the horizontal polarization state up and the vertical polarization state straight through on both ends. And so then you look at coincidences between uh, these these four detectors, the coincidences between this one and this one, this one and this one, this one and this one and this one and that one, and what you find is that when these are perfectly aligned, you would get only HH, in other words, horizontal here and here, or VV here, never HV or VH. Now, you, this thing is on a rotating base and you can twist it a little bit and change the angle. And when you do, you're no longer exactly measuring horizontal and vertical polarization in the same system. And so things change a little bit. And as you <coughs> crank it around uh, by changing the angle theta, you begin to get little, uh, a small amount of HV or VH coming in that grows as, this, uh, uh, grows as you change the angle. <coughs> now, this is where Bell comes in. Uh, he said that, he showed that if you have certain kinds of local hidden variable theories, and actually the hidden variable doesn't matter very much, it's basically if you have any kind of local theory, uh, that there should be a linear dependence on, on this growth of noise, that the noise should grow linearly with theta, and so it should follow this dotted line here. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, says this is no different from having a light source with two polarizers in front of it, and you're rotating the polarizers, and so you use Ma Malice's law, which says that the transmission ought to go like the square of the cosine of the angle, and that, gr that goes quadratically. And so quantum mechanics predicts a quadratic growth in this noise leakage, where whereas Bell's theorem <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, predicts a linear growth. And uh, <coughs> the uh, experiment was done, has been done many times now, and, uh, shown to, the, to many orders of magnitude that this is right and this is wrong, that there, and this has falsified the idea of local hidden variable theories in, in, in various ways. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, again, what's going on here is that, uh, <laughs> I already talked about this, that, that, we, that uh, what we have is re retarded waves going to both detectors and advanced wave handshakes coming back, and the only kinds of handshaking it can happen is when things match properly and conserve angular momentum uh, at the source because the polarization is dependent on angular momentum conservation. And so there's no problem in understanding the non-locality. It's not that this, exp this uh, detector is talking to this detector across a space-like difference. It's that there is this, the connections along light-like distance uh, intervals going back to the source and ensuring that the conservation laws are being observed. Okay, any, uh, that's about all I want to say about, about EPR, but uh, it's not hard to understand using the transactional interpretation. Um, okay, now, he, this thing is called a mock Z question. Question, very, very primitive question. But so, so basically, there's no magic spooky action at a distance. All of this entanglement occurs because of the waves propagating backwards in time. Yeah, that's right, that there's no... Uh, faster than light, mumbo jumbo going on. It's just basically handshakes. Okay, we got really going back. Light time now. We're traveling time. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got a different problem. To, different. <laughs> we've got. We, we have a different thing we have to swallow, but it's, it makes it easy to understand. But yes, you, you have to you have to accept, accept the existence of advanced waves. Yes. Uh, John, could you repeat why Afshar's experiment throws out the Copenhagen interpretation? Doesn't throw it out, it, but. 
it sort of depends, you know, it's really hard to pin down what the Copenhagen interpretation is because um, Bohr and uh, Heisenberg never actually wrote down something that said this is the Copenhagen interpretation. So there are many versions of the Copenhagen interpretation. I found a book in the, <coughs> in the, in the library that called the Copenhagen interpretation that never said what the Copenhagen interpretation was. So. <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that's usually attributed to the Copenhagen interpretation is that when you make uh, particle-like which-way measurements, it kills interference, okay? And, uh, and, and that's a, that assertion is, has been falsified. Now, th does that mean the Copenhagen interpretation has been falsified? Well, I guess that's a matter of opinion, but at least that assertion of the Copenhagen interpretation is, has been shown to be wrong. Is this related to the quantum eraser idea? You know, the quantum eraser erases... I'll talk about the quantum eraser in a minute. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, this is a Mach-Zehnder interferometer. It, it's, I built these things. They're t devilishly hard to align. But when they're properly aligned, if you send a photon here through a beam splitter, the light goes this way and this way, arriving here in such a way that the waves cancel going this direction, but they add going this direction, so all the light if it's properly aligned, goes from here to here and ends up at D. So this is called the light uh, port, and this is called the dark port, because if everything's properly aligned, you, don't, you never see light coming out here because of quantum interference. The reason is because to get here, light from here bounces once on this mirror and bounces three times on this mirror, and that flips the phase around so that they, so that they cancel. Whereas going here, you get two bounces, going this way and two bounces going this way and so they don't cancel, they, they reinforce. Okay, now the trick is here, you put a object here, you wanna know is there an object in this lower path? Uh, and the people who did this, uh, uh, I'm spacing on their names, but any uh, vitamin and... Uh, is it too? Okay. Elitzer and that vitamin, yeah. <laughs> described this as being a way of testing whether there was a photon sensitive bomb there, which make, makes it, I guess, more, more dramatic because it could explode. <laughs> but anyway, if you put this object here, then one half the time, a single photon going through here ends up here, one fourth of the time it ends up here, and one fourth of the time it ends up here. So they focus on the events in the dark detector where they end up here, and they point out that. <coughs> um, that uh, when you get a count here, it means that there's an object blocking this path, even though no photon has ever interacted with that object. So this is a, uh, you're detecting the presence of an object without ha having it even touched by a photon one fourth, of the, one fourth of the time. And there are also ways of jazzing this up so you can make that ratio a lot higher than one fourth if you uh, <laughs> use, use uh, uh, what's called the quantum Zeno effect. But anyway, the main point is you can detect the presence of an object without ever, ever having a photon interact with it. Uh, <clears throat> the transactional interpretation easily explains this because what you're doing, well, the reason there was no detections here is because the retarded waves coming this way and the retarded waves, the offer waves coming this way were can canceling and therefore preventing anything from happening. If there's an object here, the, the offer wave can only get this far. It can't go any further, and so therefore there's no cancellation, and so therefore the thing goes through. And so it's not that, the, that this thing has, has been, been touched by a photon. It's been that it's been touched by an offer wave and blocked, and therefore make, uh, makes this possible. So this is a non-classical uh, a way of getting non-classical knowledge about the presence or absence of a system here, and the transactional interpretation has an easy way of, of explaining it. Any questions about that? Yeah. This to me sounds like a way of uh, detecting something. If you were tra traveling near the speed of light and you want to make sure that you're going to run into something. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to have something out ahead of you, though. That, that may be difficult. <clears throat> Okay. Um. Well, does that mean that the offer wave doesn't carry any energy? It, it has a very, well, the only way you can talk about energy is when, with completed transactions. So there's no way you can measure how much energy is in an offer wave because, because the measurements all involve completed transactions. So the final, but doesn't the final this example transaction. Show, doesn't this example show that the bomb uh, uh, absorbs the offer wave without 
absorbing any energy from the alpha wave. Yes, uh, it, it prob probably did not, I mean, it, if it had absorbed energy from it, there would have had to have been a transaction involving, and that happens half the time, okay? Mm -hmm. But one fourth of the time, the offer wa that offer wave isn't selected for the transaction. Uh, <clears throat> the offer wave that went to the, uh, to the dark detector is, and so therefore there's no transaction forms to the bomb, and yet you know it's there. <clears throat> okay, this is a variation of the same experiment in which instead of uh, putting a bomb there, we, put some, we do play some games with atoms. Uh, you can take a, an atom in a certain spin state and run it through a, a stern gerlach magnet, which splits it into uh, its uh, <coughs> up and down uh, spin components. And so what we've done is to take the atom and, polar and put it in the uh, up direction along the x-axis, and then Stern Gerlach, it, uh, Gerlach analyze it along the z axis so that the uh, up spin uh, is in the, intercepts the <coughs> beam path here and the down spin doesn't. And then <coughs> we look over here. Now, uh, <coughs> what we do is only look when we detect a, a event in the dark detector over here. And what we find is that even though we have put this uh, atom in the uh, plus state here before the, before, before we did the experiment, when we look at, uh, at what the uh, <coughs> state of the atom is over here after it's been through this process, it is now in half the up state and half the down state, even though uh, <coughs> it, no photon ever interacted with it. So this is the, the same kind of argument in, involving atomic physics. Uh, it's probably impossible to do this experiment because it involves a single trapped atom and it has to stop all photons that come through. But anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting Gedanken experiment. And <laughs> there have been some elaborations of this by <coughs> Elitzer putting uh, these kinds of analyzers over here and over here and over here and over here and creating all kinds of complex situations which are hard to describe any way except with the transactional interpretation. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> This is uh, what Ray was asking about a minute ago, the which way, uh, the, the uh, quantum eraser experiment. Uh, <clears throat> this involves a nonlinear crystal. I have, I've been talking about making entangled photons and some of these things. I haven't told you how you go about making an entangled photon. But one of the standard ways of doing it is what's, with what's called down conversion. You send a pump laser beam through a nonlinear crystal, and part of the time, a pair of entangled photons with half the energy and twice the wavelength of the pump come out and along <coughs> specific angles characteristic of the crystal. So here we have the laser, a pump laser sending a beam through this crystal and a, a, a pair of entangled photons em, em, emerge going this way and that way. We put mirrors down here and send them back in the other direction. The laser beam, the pump laser beam goes on through, is reflected, goes back through, and now it has a second chance to make photons, and it makes new, uh, it, with some probability, it makes photons going this way and this way along the same track as the original ones. So if you do this and you move, say, this mirror, you can move any of them, you see maxima and minima of inter interference appearing in both of these detectors as measured in coincidence. You see the count rates go up and down and up and down as you move this mirror back and forth. You could also move one of the others back and forth, but you see that these things are interfering because you don't know whether the photon was produced going this way or whether it was produced going that way. Because you don't know, they, <laughs> the, there are equal probabilities of both and they interfere, so you see interference. Now, we stick a quarter wave plate in <clears throat> this region here. And <clears throat> what that does is rotate the <clears throat> plane of the polariza polarization by 90 degrees going, one, going through and then 90 degrees again. So now this path is labeled as different from, from this path. And so you can tell the difference between these two photons. There are two different polarization states and that kills the interference. And so now when you move this thing back and forth, you don't see these maxima and minima going up and down. However, down the line here, and this could be way off here in the distance, we put in a 45 degree polarizer, polarizing filter there, and that, <coughs> now uh, we have these two different polarization states, one this way and one that way. Now the 45 filter takes this component of this guy 
and this component of this guy, and it only lets those through. Now we can have interference again, and the interference comes back. And so you have erased the, uh, your, your which way information retroactively after the, uh, the photons have already arrived at this detector and so forth. So that's the quantum eraser experiment. How do you explain this? Well, it's easy with transactions because it doesn't matter whether you do this early or late. Uh, if you have uh, pol uh, conflicting polarization states, you get which, uh, transactions forming involving only one path. If you have compatible polarization states, you have transactions forming involving both paths, and so it's very, very easy to explain what's going on in the experiment. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Yeah. Question? Yeah. It seems like having a tool that lets you propagate things back in time makes for potentially some really convenient sleight of hand. That your theory can automatically explain whatever happens because it knows what happens because it has a solution propagating backward. Well, only if you have some way of sending signals with it, and and it turns out there's not any way of using this these advanced ways to send signals, and so you're pre you're prevented from most of this. I mean, this is nature nature sending things back and forth in time, but you're not allowed to send your own stuff. So more generally, is there some? new experiment where you would make a prediction that we don't know the answer to yet with this? Or is there some experiment that exists that would falsify this? You know, so either way, some distinction to let us evaluate. I'm not aware of any experiment that would falsify this. Uh, if you could actually send messages backwards in time, it would sort of verify it, but, uh, yeah. but you can't. Uh, <clears throat> at least not any way I know how to, of doing it. So, I mean, ultimately, uh, all, all theories are mathematical fictions, right? And their utility is just whether they happen to describe the real world. So what, what, is the new, what is the new place we might be able to take this to better describe the, the well, world? The, okay, the, the, there's a basic problem with the interpretations of quantum mechanics in that it is the, you have this formalism of quantum mechanics which emerged in a very peculiar way in the 1920s uh, well, from Schrodinger and Heisenberg, where in both cases, uh, there was no, usually you have, you have some idea, this is the way the universe works, and you sit down and write some equations and say, yes, that's, this mathematics sort of is, uh, shows how, how that's going on. In the case of uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics, Heisenberg uh, invented matrix mechanics sort of out of whole cloth without any idea what the mechanisms behind it were. It's just the mathematics that worked. Schrodinger thought he was doing something like light waves, and it turns out that doesn't work, and so, it, uh, so neither of them has any interpretation, and so you have to come in later and explain what, what, it, what it is that these equations mean, why they're there, and <clears throat> what, what's the mechanism behind it. And there are a couple, a couple of dozen different partial explanations of, of, uh, of, of what, what the equations mean and how they work. Uh, <clears throat> the leading ones, I guess, are the are the uh, Copenhagen interpretation, which everybody learns in graduate school, or, or to the extent that they learn any, any uh, interpretation at all in graduate school. The many worlds interpretation, which a lot, a lot of people like for reasons I don't completely understand. And the uh, uh, Bohm interpretation, which is basically uh, modifies quantum mechanics, so it's not really the same equations any, anymore, and, and takes away most of the sort of non-classical aspects of quantum mechanics. Um, and this one, which and this one explains all of the, all, all of the funny experiments where the others sort of wave their hands and, and, and don't. And so I would say that's what it has going for it. But uh, the other way of, uh, of dealing with quantum mechanics is what's called the shut, shut up and calculate approach, <laughs> in which you don't worry about interpretations. You just use the mathematics and, and do the calculations. And a large majority of the physicists, in fact, if you, I looked at, uh, at 12 different textbooks uh, on quantum mechanics that are currently available on Amazon, and very few of them talk about interpretations at all, and so the, the, the sort of a dominant mode of teaching quantum mechanics these days is the shut up and calculate approach. Um, but uh, you didn't mention the Born interpretation of the wave function. The Born interpretation is, uh, uh, the Born interpretation. The probability business. Yeah, yeah that, that's part of, the, part of the Copenhagen interpretation. Well, it's it's also part of the, it's also part of the transactional interpretation. Oh, it is. Yeah. So, uh, following on what you were discussing, uh, according to your view, then, at what level does the arrow of time arise? Um, 
Sorry. Uh, that's a whole different talk, and I, which I'd rather not get. There's a way of dealing with the arrow of time, but um, but I don't I don't don't really think I, I I'm uh, I've been talking for for most of my hour already, and I'm not through. So uh, okay, one last uh, uh, problem, which is not usually associated with quantum mechanics, is the so-called black hole information pro problem. Uh, you make a, a pair of a, you have a Hawking radiation event here with, where, where two photons are generated in the, in the uh, strong gravitational gradient at the edge of a black hole, and one of them goes into the black hole and the other doesn't. And these photons are entangled, uh, and, the, uh, and so the problem that uh, uh, string theorists and, and general relativity theorists and others have been worrying about for the last 20 years is how, what, what happens in the, to the, how is that entanglement broken by the uh, by the by the uh, event horizon of the black hole, and some very prominent spring theorists have made some very wacko uh, uh, assertions about it. Uh, <clears throat> these guys, for example, say that whenever you break a, break an entanglement, the energy is released. Now, why that's true, I'm not sure, but and it makes a firewall, and so anything that tries to go through the firewall is destroyed, and so you don't have to worry about the entanglement anymore. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Suskin and, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> anyway, these two guys are prominent string theorists. Have asserted that, that wormholes form, and the and the uh, entanglement is, uh, is preserved by uh, <clears throat> presence of creating wormholes and at the event horizon. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that nothing can escape a from a black hole, with one exception, and that is that advanced waves have no problems getting out of a black hole because they just retrace the pack path of the object that went in. And so if you apply the transactional interpretation to this problem, there, it goes away, basically, because the, uh, the uh, photon that goes through the event horizon and ends up inside uh, it can produce an advanced wave that comes right back out through the same path, shakes hands, and the entanglement's preserved. And so the, the, the quantum information problem goes away. OK, I'm going to stop there and talk about how transactions actually form. Uh, the wheeler feynman electrodynamics, uh, it's responses from all the absorbers of the future universe arising back together at the emitter that ca cause the object to radiate. Uh, and every, every future absorber is slightly preserved, perturbed by the arrival of an advanced wave, of a retarded wave, and it generates an advanced wave response. And in the quantum domain, this scenario has to be changed to reflect the fact that quantization is there and uh, the, and the probabilistic uh, uh, nature of the of quantum behavior, uh, and uh, furthermore, the absorber cannot accept less than a full quantum of energy, but it can be slightly perturbed. Uh, in the transactional interpretation, the Wheeler-Feynman process represents sort of the perturbative phase of transaction formation. Uh, this is based on some uh, Carver Mead has a very lovely little book called Collective Electrodynamics. And section 5.4 of this book uh, is the, uh, is the <coughs> uh, pr presents this kind of model, which I've built on. Uh, here we have a, an atom, an emitter atom. It's in a 1 minus excited state, ready to radiate. Here, over here, we have an, a, a, a po possible absorber. It's in the ground state. Notice that these are opposite parity. Uh, and <coughs> We, first of all, according to the transactional interpretation, the emitter atom send, in its one minus <coughs> excited state sends out a retarded offer wave saying, hey, I'm over here and I'm in the one, one minus excited state. And this goes in various places. And it arrives at this atom and perturbs it slightly, sort of giving a, a very, very, very tiny amount of amplitude to the one minus state of this atom. And the, the result of that is that this atom is now in a mixed state. It has a zero plus ground state with a slight perturbation of one minus, and that turns out to make it uh, make, make, to produce a dipole, a time dependent dipole oscillation in this atom. It sends back the confirmation wave and perturbs the offer wave into the ground state, and so now we have two atoms, both of which are. Uh, are perturbed in different ways, but it turns out that the dipole oscillation that happens 
is based on a frequency depending, depending on the energy difference between the main uh, state and its perturbation, and, and that energy difference is the same in both. So we have two di dipole oscillators operating at the same frequency <coughs> uh, under slightly different boundary conditions and sending, uh, sending oscillations back and forth. When, and so you get a dipole oscillation that looks something like this. Yeah. So for these tra these offer waves and retard waves, are these fields that are emitted in some way? Well, in, ele in electromagnetism, you can say this is the electromagnetic field. And in, in, uh, in when you're talking about particles like electrons and so forth, then, then you're talking about probability waves. But, that, but, but the, are, they, are they directional in some way? Yeah, they, they obey a wave equation just like, just like electromagnetic waves. But, the, but what, what the stuff is of the, of the more general uh, Schrodinger equation or Klein Gordon equation waves is is uh, is something that uh, they're often called probability waves, basically meaning you don't know what they are, you don't know what they're made of precisely. Right. Uh, okay, so this is a this is the uh, four vector electromagnetic potential generated by one of these oscillating uh, mixed states that I was talking about. This is uh, what did I miss something? I don't know. This is two uh, of them. Uh, can I just suggest that you don't call them mixed states, but rather uh, superposed states? What? And instead of calling them mixed states, which to me, uh, they, they uh, lose their phase coherence, <laughs> you should call them uh, superposition states. Okay. Because uh, you don't lose the phase. That's the whole point. Yeah, know. okay. Yes, they, you do not lose the phase. Uh, mixed states is uh, a technical term in statistical mechanics where you lose the phase coherence. Okay, that, that's a good question. <laughs> but I blame my terminology on Carver Mead, who calls them mixed states. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the, uh, this, this, if we have two of these talking to one another, we get a, 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 a pattern in the uh, electromagnetic potential, uh, for, electromagnetic four vector potential that looks like this. Uh, and if you uh, sort of look at the at the waves in this in this situation, if you trace the the paths of zero phase, you, you find that that, that you have in, have things going from here to here, all arriving in phase as they go across, transversing transfer all these paths, <clears throat> and the result is that you have an unstable situation. You have uh, two dipole oscillators, uh, <clears throat> and they're each uh, increasing the amplitude progressively of the uh, extra uh, per perturbed state on the other side. And so th these perturbed uh, levels are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it avalanches in, uh, exponentially. And so what happens is the excited state goes along, and, <clears throat> and when this uh, happens, it avalanches to the ground state, and the ground state <clears throat> and the other one avalanches uh, this way, <clears throat> and so th th it changes situations. Now I need to show some movies and let me see if I can make this system work. Okay, so this is a, this is, hmm, I'm not sure what that means. This is the, this is an oscillating one of the oscillating dipoles. Uh, this is a three-dimensional view of the same oscillating dipole. On my computer, these run continuously instead of killing like that, but anyway. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the radiating, the, the, the uh, one dipole radiating and... Uh, uh, okay, maybe that's, yeah. Okay. Is that yeah? There we go. So you can see the uh, the waves emanating from the emitter and going progressively out and converging on the on the <coughs> the absorber here as the energy and momentum are transferred through the through the uh, four vector potential in this in this case. Uh, and how do I kill this? And this is the uh, this is the same thing in three dimensions. And finally, uh, we can project out the excited state wave function 
uh, of the uh, <laughs> of the system. And here, we, here is the excited state wave function, and it transfers over here. And here's the same thing in, uh, as seen in the uh, two dimension in th three dimensions. <clears throat> okay, so th these are this is this is a Mathematica notebook that uh, implements the uh, the math mathematics using conventional quantum mechanics, except that we're using waves going in both time directions to uh, to, to to show it. And security doesn't matter. Yeah. Now I've got to go through the whole thing. Uh, uh, Don, are you using a, what we call a semi-classical approach here to, in which you treat the... It's using quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, quantum mechanics for the atom, but uh, classical uh, electrodynamics for the uh, wave. Yeah, it, well, okay. The Carver-Mead's version of, of, of quantum electrodynamics is based on uh, uh, focusing on the, on the four-vector potential rather than... than, than uh, electric and magnetic fields, and it has uh, quantum mechanics embedded in it fairly directly, and it's, a, it's sort of an interesting approach to, to doing <coughs> electrodynamics, so it's not classical. Uh, but uh, is the four vector potential classical, or is it quantized? It's quantized. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. I guess it's this one, yes. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the conclusions are that the transactional interpretation provides a rational way of visualizing and understanding mechanisms behind entanglement, non-locality, and wave function collapse. The plethora of in interpretational paradoxes and other uh, non-classical quantum optics experiment results can all be understood by applying the transactional interpretation. The process of transaction formation, at least in simple cases, emerges directly from the application of standard quantum mechanics to advance retarded wave handshakes processes as it, as it builds and avalanches to completion. And finally, as the mattress commercial says, why buy your quantum interpretation anywhere else? <laughs> uh, the other thing I should say is that this is a, uh, the only, uh, uh, <coughs> only qu interpretation that comes with its own operating manual, which is uh, my reference. This is my book, The Quantum Handshake, uh, which, uh, looks like this and <coughs> is available from Amazon <coughs> and also directly from Springer if, if you uh, particularly if you want to pay in euros uh, it's a bit cheaper in euros than it is in dollars for some reason uh, <coughs> okay and I will stop there and ask her questions so then we were talking on Tuesday night about pilot wave uh, theory you know. Ah, uh, yes, Bohm and, Bohm and mechanics. Yes, I have a... It's starting to get, it's sorry, it's a resurgence of, of interest. I was wondering how it correlates. Okay, let me say a little bit about Bohm and mechanics. Um, <laughs> um, the uh, Bohm and mechanics basically uh, takes uh, the equations of quantum mechanics and man manipulates them in peculiar ways and generates a, what's called, what Bohm calls a quantum potential, which modifies the trajectories of particles. This is a, a figure taken from uh, Bohm and Hiley, a, a book about the Bohmian interpretation that was published uh, the year after Bohm died, <coughs> showing a two-slit system. They're, actually, there's just supposed to be electrons com coming through the two slits, but they're non-interacting electrons. There's no, no electric charge associated with them. But, uh, and these lines here represent what are called Bohmian trajectories. Basically, what you do is you take the <coughs> quantum mechanical wave function and apply the momentum operator, the vector momentum operator to it to get what the local momentum is at a particular point in space. You make a vector point, uh, in that dire direction and make a step. Then you do it again and take another step and so forth. It's sort of like plotting field lines. And like field lines, the trajectories never cross. So whatever comes through this slit stays on this side. Whatever comes through this slit is it stays on this side. If you really believe that an electron coming this through this slit never goes over here, then I have a, <coughs> a nice bridge to Brooklyn and New York that I'd be, I think, think you would find an excellent investment uh, possibility. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I figured out how to calculate these things for a cross laser beam, 
And <clears throat> what I found was that if you take a pair of laser beams and cross them so that they interfere, the Bohmian trajectories turn the corner like this and they never cross over there <clears throat> either. So I propose an experiment for testing and falsifying the Bohm interpretation in which you do this. You have a, a laser beam, you break it into two pieces and make them cross at two places. And according to the Bohm Bohmian trajectories, the photons ought to turn the corner here and go this way and turn the corner here and go this way and arrive at the detector earlier than they would uh, if they, uh, <coughs> according to quantum mechanics, these, uh, these things inter <coughs> ignore one another, bounce here and go here and, and take the longer path. So it should be possible to test and falsify the Bohm interpretation by doing a time of flight measurement. Now, this particular setup is a sort of, uh, schematic, it, it has, a, has a few problems. You really want these angles here to be smaller, <clears throat> and uh, the chopping uh, creates a little bit of problem by introducing extra frequency components, but those, those are all things that can be dealt with. And I think this is a feasible experiment, and <clears throat> one of these days maybe I'll e even uh, look into actually performing it. But I, I, what my point is that I think the Bowman interpretation is telling us some wrong things. It, I, I believe by no stretch of the imagination, whoops, do <laughs> real photons in a cross laser beam do things like that and turn, turn corners. And I think that, that's sort of physically unreasonable and <clears throat> I'm not sure how the Bohmians managed to swallow that and, and really believe it. Do you know about uh, the experiment of my former student Ephraim Steinberg, who at, uh, at Toronto showed that uh, the Bohmian trajectories with this dark middle thing really? Yeah, well, the thing about the, the, these experiments that claim to show Bohmian trajectories are that they're, they're using weak measurements which are subject to the uncertainty principle, and the Bohmian uh, trajectories violate the uncertainty principle with, with extreme prejudice. So I think the claim that you're, you're seeing Bohmian trajectories is, is not, is, is a, is, is, um, is, can't be right because, because uh, weak measurements would not allow you to see a Bohmian trajectory because they're subject to the uncertainty principle. Um, I'd love to hear Ephraim's <laughs> response to that. I don't know what he would say. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyway, uh, enough about the Bohmian interpretation. Anybody have any questions about what anything else I was saying? Yeah. I was just going to comment. I really like the suggestion for an alternate experiment that you can actually verify with, but I sort of find the appeal to incredulity is not a very good argument in quantum mechanics. The whole field is based on things that that's I would have swallowed. That's a, very fair, that's a fair comment. Yes, the, the whole thing is, is is subject to believing funny things, and so. <laughs> Uh, I have a question, John, about uh, Heidi's uh, extension of your work to uh, what she calls the absorber, uh, sorry, uh, the gravitational absorber theory, in which you get backwards um, uh, <coughs> propagation of uh, gravitational waves, essentially, yeah. uh, from the far future. Yeah, well, <laughs> obviously the problem is that we don't really have a uh, a theory of quantum gravity that we can hang on to and, re and do real calculations with it. So uh, at some level you have to do the best you can and uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say beyond that because, because you know, there, there is no theory of quantum gravity that we can look at to see what, 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 how things work but one would think that <coughs> to the extent that there is our wave of phenomena associated with with gravity, they ought to work the same way. Yeah, but there, there, uh, well, maybe I should address this question <coughs> later. When, uh, yeah, maybe you should ask Heidi. Uh, yeah. Heidi, but uh, just, uh, I'd like to hear your response. Uh, in the absorber theory, um, the Wheeler-Feynman absorber yeah. theory, it's uh, very reasonable to believe that the universe is dark outside. I mean, it's a boundary condition that we observe empirically. When you look out at the sky at night, it's dark. and. So yeah, the, 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 the um, it's a reasonable uh, asymptotic boundary condition. Okay, it, 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 I mean, no, you have to make an assumption of the absorber theory uh, uh, concerning the far future. Otherwise, you don't get a consistent theory. It seems to me. Uh, I don't exactly understand what you said, but there, there's the problem that um, Wheeler, Wheeler and Feynman assume that the absorbers lie in the future, not in the past. Yeah, Is that what, yeah, that what yeah, you're yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. 
and yet uh, the, the, the past is sort of hot and dense and the future is black and open yes. and so it, there's a there's an arrow there's an arrow that they sort of they sort of ad hoc chose yeah it. exactly okay, <laughs> okay the, the, I can refer you to some papers that I wrote on the subject a while back uh, but uh, one of the th one of the things to say is what is it that, that asymmetrizes the universe well if you imagine that you make advanced waves and they go back to, in the direction of the uh, <coughs> of the past uh, how far can they go well they can't go past the big bang so the big bang represents a sort of a uh, uh, <coughs> a short a stopping point that they can't go any further and in wave guy uh, uh, transmission line theory if you have a short and a transmission line what you get is a reflection that goes back the other way. So my view is that the arrow of time is created by the fact that we have a big bang, a big bang singularity in our past, and an open universe in our future. So you can't have the advanced waves going that way. You can, uh, and so things have to move forward, and that's what de determines the direction of time. And I have a paper that makes those arguments that I published in Fizrav many years ago. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, can we thank the speaker?